Well, thank you for inviting me today to speak to you regarding um, how we can help work as a team to provide uh, supportive footwear um, for our, our clients and patients that uh, require more than just the average shoe might provide. Um, I thought I'd start with introducing myself a little bit more. Um, I do own Bedford Orthotics and I've been there for 17 years. And uh, I started out with a, a Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology and I became a Canadian Certified Pedorthist in 1993. And then after working 10 years at Orthotics East downtown, I uh, opened my clinic in Bedford above Cora's Restaurant in Bedford. And we do have an on-site lab as well where we do our own manufacturing of the orthotics and uh, which allows me also to do modifications to, uh, to footwear to uh, provide uh, the next step uh, in uh, providing the care that uh, your clients may, may require. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, person that I saw. He's a 51-year-old male and he was diagnosed with high blood pressure and heart disease due to an inactive lifestyle. He had um, a great desire and motivation to get physically active to try to address his health issues. And he bought what he thought was an appropriate shoe and uh, started on a walking program. Unfortunately, once he started in his walking program, he developed uh, severe pain in his first MTP joints from uh, a hallux rigidus with osteoarthritis. And he wasn't able to continue his walking program. So when he came to see me, my first course of action was to address why that was happening. But as we know, a rigid joint, it, it's not correctable, it's, it's fused. So even though I was able to address why the pressure was excessive on the first MTP joints, um, I couldn't change that. So, so the next, the only way to address this particular problem was to build a rigid rocker onto the bottom of the walking shoe to address the fact that the first MTP joints were no longer able to function as a propulsive mechanism to move the body over the foot. So we were able to address within the shoe to um, provide the support that he needed and realignment to take the weight off of the big toe joint. but the shoe allowed him to continue to move the body forward so he could actually go out and go walking. So once we, were able, once we fitted him with a proper walking shoe and built the rigid rocker, which there's a rigid rocker going around, um, this is a picture of it here, um, then that allowed uh, him to continue his walking program and reduce weight and, and, and have a, a healthy um, lifestyle and an active lifestyle. So a rigid rocker is um, a combination of a rigid flex point, so there's the, the front part of the shoe should not flex, and um, the front of the shoe should have a toe spring, which when you get to the point where you would move your body over your foot by bending your, your first MTP joint, the shoe does that for you. So that's what a rocker is. And I, I brought um, a shoe that has a rocker because even though I'm talking about footwear modifications today, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that a lot of the modifications I'm going to talk about can be addressed in standard um, orthopedic footwear. And this particular shoe does have a rigid rocker, so when you try to bend the front of the shoe, it doesn't bend, and when you put it on a flat surface, can't see it. Um, it trust me that it rolls forward as you're walking and that means that when you get to the point where normally you would bend your foot the shoe continues to roll forward so often I if I can fit somebody in a shoe that uh, is going to provide what they need I may not necessarily need to do uh, a modification to the shoe but the modification is certainly an option if we have to go that route the second case study that I'll talk about regarding the rigid rocker is somebody with foot drop or foot slap um, this particular individual that I saw has um, Parkinson's disease with right side affected and when he walks instead of moving the body over the foot in a nice controlled manner because of the, uh, the muscle um, that's not, that the muscle is stiff and not in control, then the foot is not able to continue to move forward so the foot slaps the ground. And so in that particular case, we want to encourage the foot to have more control at toe off and we also use a rigid rocker in that situation. So the rigid rocker is the, is the first one. Let me see if I can figure this out. 
So the second uh, modification we're going to talk about, and um, that one is on the top, on the front left table here, is uh, a shoe lift. And a shoe lift is uh, designed for somebody with a leg length difference. So how many people here know the difference between a structural and a functional leg length difference? Well, I'll explain that first because it's really important to um, know that when someone has one leg longer than the other, the only time we would address it with an actual lift, either inside the shoe or outside the shoe, is if it's a measurable structural leg length difference. So we have people lie down and we measure from the top of the pelvic on the iliac crest to the medial malleoli and that gives us an actual measurable number as to what the leg length actually is. And there are people that come in that look like they have a significant leg length difference, but in reality, they have what's called a functional leg length difference from either an imbalance in the pelvis or a scoliosis or something going on that's contributing to the, the leg length, but it's not structural. The only exception to the rule would be somebody who has a fixed um, bend in their, one of their knees. And as the crow flies, when you measure, you're going to measure um, with the bend, and that's going to present as a shorter leg on that side. So you would address that with a lift on the, on the shorter side. So what we do with leg length, from the measured amount, we correct for half of the total with the full height at the heel, and then half of that height at the half of the measured amount at the heel, and then half of that at the, at the metatarsal heads, and then tapered off at the, at the toe. So that is an example of a, of a heel lift. It's actually more than just the heel because it addresses the whole foot. So I have a picture of a, um, a flare here, but I'm going to actually talk about flare and buttress at the same time, because buttress would be uh, an extension of the flare up over the upper of the shoe. So when you think about a buttress, you're thinking about a, we're making a wall on the side of the shoe to work with the shoe itself and what's in the shoe to prevent movement, either medial or lateral, depending on the situation. So the person I'm going to talk about in this case is a flexible, very flaccid flat foot. And when this person stands up, her foot actually almost touches the ground at the medial malleoli. It's that flat. So regardless of the shoe that we're selecting for her or the orthotic that we're putting in the shoe, the, the, it just wasn't enough. So we had to put something on the shoe to extend the sole of the shoe and build up over the upper to prevent the foot from continuing to, to pronate. Um, and that is exactly what, th what this person needs. The opposite, the lateral or the, um, the lateral buttress or flare uh, addresses supination or somebody with a significant uh, bowing in their lower leg. So we would do the opposite and build on the outside of the shoe to prevent the foot from rolling to the outside. So when a lot of times I would do this as um, an adjustment to the shoe after the fact. So we always attempt to do what we can inside the shoe with our custom orthotic and then choose a shoe that's a neutral shoe that's stable. But in some cases, that's just not enough. And we have to build it on the outside of the shoe to work in combination with, um, with the, uh, the shoe and the orthotic. And then that does, does the trick for a lot of people. So this is a very, unfortunately, poor photo, but uh, hopefully you can see that hole in the center. Um, and this is uh, actually going to flow quite nicely from Terry and Barbie's uh, um, conversations this morning. Oftentimes when we're excavating for offloading for either a, a prominent bone or a diabetic ulcer, what we can do with the orthotic to get it to the depth that it needs to be to offload, particularly an ulcer, it would have to be so thick in order to build the excavation into the orthotic that we can do a similar excavation in the shoe. And this one is actually an excavation into the uh, midsole of the shoe 
And sometimes we'll actually leave it as an open hole and sometimes we can fill it with PPT or something softer that would um, provide cushioning where the sole may be a harder material. So the, the di people with diabetes or anybody with a bony prominence or um, rheumatoid arthritis uh, nodules will often benefit from having excavations done within the sole of the shoe as well as what we can do with, with the orthotic. So this is a, a picture of a balloon stretch. Um, you can either do it with a, a stretch with using a, a, a ball and ring type stretcher or actually cut a hole in the leather and stitch on a larger piece of leather to increase the, the volume at that area. What I want to say regarding that is we have a couple of options um, with, in addition to modifying the shoe. Number one, we can choose shoes that are made out of um, a soft neoprene type material that will mold into whatever bony prominence happens to be there, such as bunions, hammer toes, claw toes, wherever you may find that you're having issues with pressure spots on the top of the toes or on the, um, on the bunion. So that's one option. I always say these types of shoes are kind of one step before custom because they're often for people that can't buy a leather shoe because it just will not fit their foot and they have feet that may not necessarily be um, the proper shape to what a normal foot would look like. Um, and then secondly, a lot of it boils down to the fit. And if you can find a double depth shoe like uh, Terry was talking about, PW Minor and Ambulator make a DX2, which is a double depth half inch uh, extra space shoe, that particular shoe would provide the depth that you would need to accommodate particularly hammer toes and claw toes where you shouldn't be putting them in a shoe that's not deep enough and then trying to modify the shoe to fit the toe. You want to fit the shoe properly in the first place. And the only time I would do um, this type of stretch would be if the shoe fit everywhere else and then the bunion was protruding out beyond the line of the shoe. And if we were to go to a larger shoe, then the shoe would be just too large overall. Then we'll stretch out that part of the shoe. The other thing that we can do in the, on a similar note if you have somebody come in with an athletic shoe and you're comfortable with a seam stitcher, or it's not stitcher, a, a ripper, um, this type of shoe where it has a, a piece of leather that crosses right over the MTP joint, what I do in that case is I actually remove this section of the shoe. And the first time it was a little bit scary because I didn't know what was underneath it, but sometimes you have to just go out on that limb a little bit. Um, but the mesh continues underneath the leather, so if there's a one spot that seems to be putting pressure on a particular part of the foot, you can actually cut and remove that section to open up the, uh, the mesh area and then you won't have pressure directly on, on the bone. So we do what I call doctoring the shoes on a regular basis to uh, try to address whatever the issues may be. Particularly if that person has just purchased the shoe and it's their favorite shoe and they've spent a couple hundred dollars on it and everything else about the shoe is great, then you can, um, you can do these little, little modifications to help make the shoe more comfortable and reduce risk and injury as a result of wearing the shoe. This is a satch heel, and uh, we use satch heel for people with um, rigid ankle joints that are either um, tarsal coalition, co coalition syndrome or a, a fused joint due to surgery or um, ankle fracture or whatever the case may be. And this um, cushioning that we've built into the heel will reduce impact at the heel and increase range of motion to allow that person to have a normal um, ambulation over their ankle joint. So many modifications don't have names, as I've just commented regarding what I do as far as doctoring shoes. The, the point I want to make about shoe modifications is that it's part of what we have in our toolbox to provide our patients or clients with what they need to address their problem. 
Now I always say we're not in the business of selling shoes and making orthotics, we're in the business of solving problems. And whatever that takes, whether it's a, um, a, a modification to a shoe or a special shoe or an orthotic or a toe crest or toe spacer or compression stockings or whatever it may look like, all of those things are things that we can provide in our toolbox to meet the need of the patient. And, uh, and so this is just one more thing that we can do to offer that extra amount of, of uh, service to our clients and patients to work together to, to accomplish our, our goals. Someone might ask, well, what, why would you do a modification to a shoe and not just do a custom shoe? And there are two reasons. One is price, because Custom shoes can be anywhere between $1,500 to $2,000, and they don't last any longer than any other shoe. And second, style, that we can address the style issues that people may have more so than if you were to go custom. So we can actually pick out a shoe that's fitting properly and that, that the person actually likes, and then do the modification that's appropriate for that individual. So the magic of modifications is that it helps ease patients' pain and gets them on a, um, with better mobility and gets them on a, a path to having happy, healthy feet.